Brands have developed an incredibly long laundry list of tasks and issues. It's got in-housing, transparency, measurement, privacy and data concerns, flat or low growth, plain packaging, other branding bans, category busters, fickle consumers, Amazon, Facebook, disruption, brand safety, on-demand culture, laws, regulations, wall gardens, fraud, crises, antitrust issues and trust. You know, the branding bans obviously uh, have their origin with um, tobacco companies. Other brands have kind of been staring over the garden hedge with a, well, it's going to be fine, it's not going to affect us, it's not our problem. In 1985 and forward from there for about 15 years, you would talk about the slippery slope and people really didn't believe you. We have to defend tobacco advertising because it's going to happen to food, it's going to happen to liquor, it's going to happen to these other categories. No one believed it until now it, it happened. So when the, the plain packaging or uh, a brand ban, the banning of brands, the, ability, the inability to use your own trademark, your intellectual property, when that first became proposed, it was proposed because the ad bans didn't work. Ad bans were proposed for tobacco to um, discourage tobacco usage. And that didn't work. And as a result, the next quiver in the um, arsenal was, OK, well, if we can't just ban the advertising for the product, let's restrict access to the product through um, promotion. Let's restrict licensing of the product. Let's restrict the um, uh, access to the product through point of sale, and finally, let's take the brand off the product itself. All of these, it's like a roadmap that can be used by those who want to restrict and impact behavior, whether it's for liquor or it's for sugary products or it's for uh, carbonated beverages, and it's a roadmap. And it is a roadmap, to answer your question. I think it's a roadmap that has been pulled out by the WHO and by other um, regulatory authorities and been followed category by category in different areas. And, it, and you know, does it work? We just saw another presentation where it doesn't work. Brands don't make people smoke. Brands don't make people drink liquor. Brands don't make people um, drink soda or drink coffee. Um, I, I use an example, and I think it's an interesting example of the importance of brands. Brands are something that are used to indicate um, source of a product. And it's true sense. Trademark is, was invented to show a source of a product. It, it's an old wor word that goes back to old England, and the, the trademark was on the back of silver products to show what silver maker made the product, and it showed the source of the product, and that was the trademark. There's no question that the brand of 180 years ago, or 85 years ago, whatever it was, became the brand that is today through a long-term, lengthy protection of that brand, long-term, lengthy freedom of speech to get the message across to consumers. And the forward-thinking CMOs and the people in the brands today would be thinking 10, 15, 20 years ahead, what's going to happen if these bans come into place? What's going to happen to my brand and equity value? And we saw what the consequences will be with some great presentations here. And we saw the consequences of the failures of the nanny state in changing behavior. And unintended if, consequences as well. The unintended well. consequences. But if you're the CMO of a brand, you're not measured by what's going to happen five years from now. Right. You're measured by what you did this year. This quarter. Did you, did you, this quarter, did you move the growth? Did you move the needle? The, I don't know the last time AdAge did it, but I, I best recall the average life tenure of a CMO of a brand was less than two years. So if, if you're faced with, you're the steward of your brand and the growth of your brand, and your job isn't long term, your job is short term, then these priorities get pushed down. They get pushed down despite the fact that they are critically important to the longer term growth. So until there is the poster child, to use that expression, things will not change. I'll, I believe that at some point in the next six months to a year, Someone will be indicted and arrested for media transparency failures. When that moment happens, then people will change. When the, on, on, the, on the packaging bans, when a, 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 you know, the plain packaging, when a brand and their shareholder value goes into the toilet and investors lose all sorts of money, that'll be the moment when people wake up.
and look at the long-term perspective. But until we can get the short-term realities of what this marketplace demands of its CMOs balanced against the long-term needs of a brand, you've got a challenge that I don't know you can win. To fight successfully some of these efforts, you need to get the business people concerned and not just worried that the sky is for falling, but meaningfully engaged into the dialogue. And it's hard to do because these are complicated, time-consuming, long-range thinking issues. It's not a check-the-box Excel sheet next quarter issue. And that's why it, may, it becomes very um, uh, challenging in order to engage. The bad guy out there is the regulator. The bad guy is the government that wants to come in and step in and be the nanny state. I've had enough experience with regulators over the 40 some odd years I've done this, that if you sit there and you say to a regulator, congressman or a senator or someone from the Federal Trade Commission, you know, you have to understand how you're hurting my industry, how you're hurting my industry. Right. They, they, forget it. Better that's sure. what their job is. Their job is to hurt your industry because that's what they perceive to be their duty. On the other hand, if you go and you say to these regulators and congressmen and senators, here's what you're doing to your constituency. Here's how you're hurting your voter. Forget about me. You know, I'll just be a secondary consequence to the harm you're doing to the consumer out there, the consumer himself or herself. When that's the message, then they listen because that's who keeps them in their job. Regulators don't trust anybody. Consumers don't increasingly trust brands particularly young consumers who don't even understand what advertising is. I read an article the other day that uh, the alpha generation, this is after 2010, uh, uh, the anecdote was a parent put their kid in front of a TV, put on whatever they were gonna wa have them watch. They walked out of the room, a few minutes later, the child comes r screaming out of the room saying the TV's broken, the TV's broken. They go inside and it was broken because it was a commercial on. They didn't even know what it was and they thought it was broken. So, so this this distrust factor, and if you look at this from the transparency perspective, from, from the, the packaging perspective, all of these things are a result of a nanny state, to use the, you know, one of the references I made earlier, stepping in into this distrust arena and trying to dictate to us, okay, here's how we're going to bring back trust. We're going to bring back trust by banning this. We're going to bring back trust by regulating this. And in fact, we have seen countless times that the nanny state, the government intervention, on that kind of restoration of trust. I defy anybody to tell me where that's ever worked. Where it has worked, and you take like children's advertising and some of the other things that right. we have in, this, in the marketplace here in the States, it has worked in self-regulation, where the industry has gotten together and decided on its own that we're gonna restore trust in our brands by, by self-restricting what we do in children's advertising, what we do in different kinds of advertising, with discus with, with, with their alcohol advertising, the tobacco industry with, with their self-regulatory moves. That's what works. But the consumers just don't trust that. The regulators don't yeah. trust that. So we have this vacuum that has occurred, uh, largely because of the digital revolution, if you want to call it that, that has just created a vacuum, a discourse that has become anything but fake. I mean, it's all fake discourse. I mean, you can't get the truth anymore. So who steps in when you can't find truth, when you can't find trust? The government. Picking up on what you said, the gen what is the generation after 2010? Alpha. I've got outfits I wear 2010, you know, it's like <laughs> 2010 seems like yesterday, but the alpha generation, um, they don't trust in institutions. And you see that breakdown of trust against institutions cross the board, whether it's governments, um, religions, um, universities institutions and you know this is a very diverse crowd it's going around the world this distrust of institutions does segue into distrust of brands the younger generation the new generations emerging generations trust influencers influencers don't need the brand to sell the goods and there's a lot of you know startup brands all of a sudden that come from nowhere and become huge successes versus the institutional packaged good companies who are struggling and so this, the threat of what we're talking about is a significant regulatory threat in the fabric of what's going on in the marketplace where trust and um, reliance on brands is shaken anyway. And you impose on that the whole transparency issues, which I hope you, you've read about, the issues of transparency in the marketplace and the challenges between agencies and media um, buying companies and clients right now. 
there's so many significant um, impacts that are shaking the fabric of the marketplace right now. You impose on that the plain packaging issue, which could just take away your ability to do branding. It's a very challenging environment for a marketer who comes out of MBA school and you know has learned marketing 101, and it's not marketing 101 at all. We're in an international room with lots of international people in, I forget whether it's 70 countries around the world or, you know, it may be 70, it may be 85. Many countries around the world have self-regulatory mechanisms. Self-regulation is, by definition, self-regulation of the industry, by the industry, for the industry, but independent of the industry should be run efficiently more efficient than legal action, but is, it is to establish credibility and trust with consumers and the marketplace, as well as to forestall unnecessary regulation. IAA getting behind the headlines of some of these very, very important issues. To be continued.